All Nation Sunday's coming up ju- uh, the 17th um, of this month. I can't wait for that. I'm excited to try some food and all that. That's going to be fun. Um, the church van, if you haven't noticed, it's parked on the on the side there. It'll be, praise the Lord. <laughs> what a blessing. <laughs> what a blessing. We go ahead and and decide to uh, move the funds to the, the sound system, and God provides a van just like that. So I believe it was the will of God. I believe we were we were being led by the Spirit, and uh, it's a good van. I drove it on the freeway. Um, it doesn't have to go on the freeway. It just needs to go around this area. But it's still it was a good it was a good drive. I think everything will be all right. And uh, if not, I've, we've got people here that can fix it. We can fix it if something goes wrong. Yes, it is. We got the maximum 15 passengers. So excited excited about that. Harvest Party and how if there are some that are going, I know already. It's this Saturday between 6 and 8. There'll be trunk or treat. There'll be bounce house. There'll be hayride. There'll be games. There'll be food. So bring some uh, cash for the food. But everything else is free. It'll be a lot of fun. It always is. If you want to go and bring the kitties, they will enjoy that. Tuesday, I'm going to make this announcement again. But Tuesday, Brother Starr had come to me, and I agree 100%. We're going to pray and fast for uh, the Abrego family. We are going to pray for them. We want we want God's will to be done in, in, in their family. So we're going to make this announcement again. I just wanted to get it out there in case I forget or something. <laughs> we're going to pray for them again. Uh, and fast. I want everybody to participate. I want 100% participation uh, on this. If you can't fast due to medical reasons, try to fast something. Amen. Try to fast something if you can for for the Abrego family. Tuesday. Praise the Lord. Good to see you. Good to see you. Glory a Dios. Glad to have you here. Praise God. We're going to get into the word of God. We're going to Continue our lesson on integrity. Pastor, how many lessons are you going to teach on this? I got about seven, I think. I was looking at it today, and I thought I would be done. <laughs> and I said, oh, and there's still, still more. But let me tell you something. In a world teaches and preaches nothing but lying and stealing and uh, uh, being deceptive and, and doing uh, evil, I think the church has an opportunity we should teach about goodness and God's love and having integrity and having wholeness of heart and doing the right thing. Somebody told me a long time ago, integrity is doing the right thing. Amen. So I think somebody needs to talk about that. We know integrity, it means to be whole, complete. Uh, So if you tell one lie. Do you still have your integrity? You do not. You do not. You have lost it. If you steal, if you use the Lord's name in vain, just one time, this morning, (laughs) yesterday, you have lost your integrity. And you, you need to repent and ask God to help you. No one likes I talked about this a couple weeks ago. Nobody likes a two-faced person. Amen. I know there's an expression in Spanish about that. Two, someone who has two faces, someone who is one way two in your face and different when, when they're not in your face. Yes. Nobody likes that. And let me tell you something. You don't want to be that person. You don't want to be a person who is one way in front of people and another way when people are not watching you. You'll be miserable. You'll, you'll, you'll never be happy. Like some people say, what you see is what you get. And I, I, don't, I like that this much in my life. I like that this much because you know what I believe? I believe what you see is what you get. That's great. But I do believe that Jesus is still working on me. I do believe that it took him, what, just a week to make the suns, the moon, and the stars, Jupiter, and Mars. 
but he's still working on me. And what you see is what you get. That's true. But let me tell you something. I'm going to the word of God. God, tell me about myself. Search me, Lord. Tell me, God, who I am and who I can be in Christ. Because I want to be more than who I am today. I want to be more for God than what I, what I am today. I want to be more for him. Anyone who only lives for God in his, in his or her spare time is wasting their time. And I'm not trying to be mean, but what I'm saying is there's not a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time. We don't know how much time we have. So we don't want to want to waste our time coming to church looking like an angel and then looking like a devil during the week. My neighbor came and he asked for prayer for his brother who had cancer and then got cancer again. He's very, he's very upset, and I can understand. And he said he doesn't, you know, we want this new surgery. They're going to cut him wide open, and they're going to take, you know, surgery. They're going to take pieces of organs out, and they're going to, oh, man, I can't Im imagine what they're going to do. And his brother is obviously scared. And I said, we're going to pray for sure. I'm going to pray that either God heals them or that the doctors are very skillful and they know what they're doing and they go in there and they, and they do what has to be done and it works out in his favor. I said, but, but if it doesn't work out in his favor, if it doesn't go well, I want you to ask your brother, what kind of heart do you want to have while you're going under surgery? Do you want to have a heart that hates God? That's mad at God for your situation when tomorrow may never come for you? Or do you want to have a heart that says, God, I love you no matter what? Because if I'm going to meet you, I want to meet you with a whole heart. So we have to be careful even in our trials that we don't lose our integrity, that we don't lose our love for God. Because it's easy to worship God when everything is going well. It's easy to love God when you've got the new car and the new house and the new position and nobody's sick in your house. It's easy to run the aisles and lift up your voice and, and praise the Lord. But do not lose, my brothers and sisters, do not lose your love for God when you're going through a trial or when you're facing a situation. There's not enough time. You don't have enough time. Be careful or you could be like those who said in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? Many are going to say, but God, but God. But God, I did this, uh, and I did that, uh, and, and, and I helped at the church, uh, and I helped put the carpet, and I built the walls, uh, and, and, and I, I helped pray people through the Holy Ghost, and I helped bring people to church. I picked them up. I, I took time out of my day. But God, but God. But something was missing. Something was lacking. Verse 23, and then. Will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. You were doing all these things, thinking that maybe you could earn your way into heaven. I don't know. But your heart wasn't in it. It's one thing doing something for God, but it's another thing being led to do something for God. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. I talked about that two weeks ago. That hurts my feelings. I can't imagine my mother or father, my wife or children telling me that they're ashamed of me. Ashamed of my behavior or ashamed of who I've become. And I definitely cannot imagine my God. Well, you know, you don't have to worry about that as long as you are never ashamed of him. If someone comes to you and says, what are you doing on Sunday? Uh, I don't know, watching football. 
watching soccer? No, I'm going to church. I go to church. You go to church? Yeah, I go to church, man. You want to come? You need to get Jesus, just like I got Jesus. Don't be ashamed of God. Don't be ashamed of what God has done for you. Don't be ashamed how God has changed you, how God has made you, how God has corrected you. Do not be ashamed of the Lord, because if you are, he'll be ashamed of you. Hey, man, just have a drink. I don't do that. Just, just, you know how the world is, especially at work. Why don't you just come with us to the bar? Let me tell you something, my friend. I would do that a long time ago. <laughs> but something happened in my life. There was a change. I went to this old Pentecostal church. Somebody invited me, and, and I came, and I heard the preaching of the word of God, uh, and it did something to my inside. It did something to my heart uh, that that drink could never do. Uh, all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I felt satisfied. Uh, I, felt like I, I felt like I was renewed, uh, reborn, and I came up to an altar, uh, and I gave my life to this Jesus uh, who died for me. Uh, friend, uh, you can have the same thing. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. This is from an a unknown author. Satan does, not need, Satan does not need to accomplish much to destroy integrity. Because integrity, like we said, has to do with wholeness. It only takes a little crack, a little chip. Anybody ever said, heard the expression, that person has a chip on their shoulder? It only takes a, a little chip. They're missing something. It only takes a little small chip to destroy integrity. Integrity is 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You have to maintain your integrity, maintain what, uh, what you have been taught by the word of God. And that means consistently making right choices. I have family. Anybody else have family? Anybody have family that's always in trouble? Anybody have, have family that just can't seem to get right? <laughs> Anybody have family that if it weren't for their problems, you would have no problems because they bring their problems to you all the time. And they cost you money. <laughs> and they cost you time. And they cost you stress. And they cost you frustration. Isn't that terrible? And my cousins and my family come to me and they say, why do you have it so good? How come you don't do drugs? How come you don't, you don't owe money to, to everyone? And how, you know, why, why are you, how come you never went to jail? Why do you have it so good? Well, I make good choices. That's really what it comes down to. You hearing me? You make good choices. Integrity is, a, is you consistently making good choices. A, I could do this, and if I get caught, I, I'll go to jail. B, I'll turn away from it, and I don't have any chance of going to jail. You know what? I'm going with B. You know why? I remember when uh, I was young and my mom just got divorced from, from my dad. and We were living in, uh, in Detroit, and, and um, my mom, we had one vehicle, a little Escort. Anybody remember those, the Escorts? Those were little tiny cars. And uh, we, as kids, we rode in the back, you know, the back back. Not, there's no seats there. You're just <laughs> in the trunk, <laughs> in the hatchback, we call it, the trunk. And, and we didn't think nothing of it. It was like, get in the back. Everybody gets, you know, three of us in the back and three adults in the, the little seat and two adults up front and sometimes a little kid in the middle shifting. Yeah, we was crazy. And I thought that was bad until I was driving on Livernois one day in Detroit going to E&L, getting some uh, uh, fajitas. And I looked at this little fiesta. Who remembers those? They're smaller. They're sm They're probably about this long from here to here. <laughs> a little smaller. 
so small, this high, I don't know. And I thought there was three adults in the, in the back seat, two adults in the front. And I thought, man, that car was down. It was way down. I mean, I'm not saying the adults are big. There's just a lot of them. <laughs> I thought, I, and it kind of reminded me when I was a kid how we were in the back seat of the Escort. And then I was sitting at the light, and I seen these three little heads pop up. <laughs> there were three kids in the back. No offense, they were, they were Mexican, I'm sure. And I thought I had it bad, but wow. <laughs> There's always somebody who's got it worse than you. But here they, my uncle, would, he had borrowed our, our escort. He borrowed it on a Friday night. And he did what he does and got drunk and wrapped it around a telephone pole, literally wrapped it, probably 80 miles an hour around a telephone pole. And they somehow pulled out his broken body out of that mess. Uh, he survived it, jaw wired, all broken bones and everything. But that was our only means of transportation. That was gone. I'm completely gone. I hate my uncle. I hate him for what he did. I hated the alcohol. I hated that, that feeling. And I said, I'll never do that because I'll never call somebody else problem. I'll never want, I don't ever want to hurt somebody else the way he hurt us. We had to walk everywhere. I'm in Michigan winters, and believe me, those who have been here for a little bit, winter can be worse than what you've experienced. It can be a lot worse, and that's what it was like when I was growing. And we all remember, it seems like the winters were harder, weren't they? 15, 20, 30, 30 40 years ago, I felt like they were harder. And he made a choice to do what he did and and just cause us to struggle, struggle, my mom to struggle. And this is what integrity is. It's making consistently good choices or choices that aren't going to hurt you or anybody else. And as people of God, even people in church, even people who have the Holy Ghost, even people who've been baptized in Jesus' name, even people that cry at the altar and weep and lead music and, and preach and teach, sometimes we get a thought in our head. Sometimes we get an idea of something that we want to do. Have you asked God? And I've told you before, I, the worst, one of the things I, 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 I just, I don't like is when people come to me and said, I've made a decision to do this or do that. Well, did you pray about it? Did we talk about it at all? Well, yeah, I asked God, and he said yes. Are you sure you asked God? Are you your God? Or is God God? Think about that. Who did you ask, yourself? Or did you find some people just to agree with you? We like to do that, don't we? Find people to agree with us when we feel better. We have to consistently make right choices. And that takes asking God. And that takes risking that God could say no. Uh -uh. That takes risking that your pastor could say no. Don't do it. It's not good news. That's not the way to go. I must be the same on the outside that I am on the inside. Your life should match your lips. Your life should match your lips. What you say is what you do. Amen. What you say is exactly what you do. When you say, Pastor, I'll meet you there for the work day, I'll be there, you show up. I'll be at church on Sunday, you show up. You, you have a, a job, right? You have to go to your job every day. If you don't, what happens? You get fired. Rightly so. 
What you say is what you do. And if you can't show up, you text or you call, you explain what happened. Because we have the technology today to do that. James chapter 1, verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving your own self. You are being deceived. If all you do is come and listen to the word of God, but you leave here not changed. You leave here with no intention on being changed. Say, Pastor, this is pretty heavy stuff. Yes, it is. But your soul and the souls of your children and your husband and your wife and the people you're around depend. Depend 100% on you getting this word. <clears throat> it's not me. It's, Je it's the teaching of the Bible. It's the words of Jesus, the words of the apostles. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, looking at himself in the mirror. And then, for he beholdeth himself and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. He forgot who it was he was looking at. He was supposed to take care of some things, but he didn't do it. He forgot. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. I like how the apostle puts it, and that's another Bible study, but he calls it the law of liberty. Pastor, all these, these, these precepts and, and all these, uh, these laws, and, and how can you say they're liberty? They feel like they're binding me. Well, let me tell you something. When you follow God's way, you don't have to worry about prison. You don't have to, you don't have to worry about uh, being in the wrong place sometimes at the wrong time. Because you're not going to go there. You're not going to do that. It's liberty. You're, you'll be set free by the law of God. You'll be set free from what? From sin. Free from shame. Chuck Colson, he used hyperbole, which means he exaggerated. Anybody here ever exaggerate? You ever exaggerate anything? You ever hear my wife tell a story and then have me tell the same story? There are going to be two different stories. And sometimes I'll, I'd rather have her tell it because it's more interesting. <laughs> I'll, I'll start and I'll say, you know, honey, you tell it. And I just like to say, I want to hear the new details. <laughs> I want to hear uh, what I didn't. I was there, but maybe I somehow I missed, I missed some of it. <laughs> so this man was exaggerating. He said the three most important ingredients in Christian work. What could be the three most important ingredients in Christian work? He said integrity, integrity, integrity. Those are the three most important ingredients in Christian work. You must have integrity, you must have integrity, and you must have integrity. Nothing will baffle a sinner or baffle a family member more than when you are just straightforward, simple, and truthful. And I've said this before, but I don't do drama. I don't do family drama, and I don't do church drama. I, I don't have enough time for it. I, I don't have energy, Sister Grace. I don't have energy for drama. I don't like it. If I said something that offended you, come to me, and either I'll explain it, or maybe it was the truth. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, maybe you should have been offended, and maybe I need to apologize. I don't know, but come to me, and, and we'll talk about it. Don't go to somebody else. That doesn't solve anything. So I, 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 don't, I don't like drama. I don't, I don't do it very well. You must be, I like to be straightforward, simple, honest. A little boy went over to his pastor's house where the pastor was doing some carpentry in his garage. Sounds like me. And the boy simply stood there, and he watched him for quite a long time. And the preacher wondered why this boy was watching him and was finally so curious that he stopped. And he said, son, mijo, are you trying to pick up some pointers on how to build something? Are you trying to learn? Are you watching me so you can learn? The little boy replied, no, 
I'm just waiting to hear what a preacher says when he hits his thumb with a hammer. I just want to hear what, what, what a preacher says. In other words, I'm curious about if what's on the inside is the same that you preach on the outside. I want to know if what you preached on Sunday is how you are on Monday and how you are on Tuesday and Wednesday. I was, I remember my assistant pastor and Taylor, Brother Mike Giamaco, telling me, or he was preaching, I guess, and he was telling a story about how he would get a paper every day, newspaper. Anybody remember those, reading newspapers every day? We don't do that no more. But it used to be a big thing. You get your paper every day. And he would go to work, and he would read his paper. And there was one guy, you know, he never got his own paper. But he was always waiting. You done with that? You done with that? You done with that? And you, and when I'm done, I'll, I'll give it to you. And then when he would finish, he would give it to the, the, the gentleman. And that you know what? That gentleman got frustrated. He finally got frustrated with Brother Mike. You know what he told him? He said, you know you can grab two papers. <laughs> you know you can get two papers for the price of one. You don't even have to pay. You don't have to pay for two. But you put your quarter in, and the whole thing opens up, and you can grab as many as you want. And that way I can read. <laughs> Ain't the devil something? How bold. You're trying to get me to steal because you're lazy. And you don't want to spend your own quarter? Well, Brother Mike, Brother Giamaco, you have to know him. He looked at him, and he, and, he, and he squints his eyes, and that's how he is. He said, I'm not going to hell for a quarter. <laughs> Are you kidding me? A quarter? Think about it, church. A quarter. <laughs> is stealing. If it's a penny, if it's a quarter, I remember my my son ate a green bean in the grocery store. He grabbed a green bean and had he started <laughs> started eating it. And my wife got so mad because she didn't pay for it. And she made she made him go up to the cash register and tell the cash cashier what he had done. He ate. I ate a green bean. <laughs> integrity. You're teaching your kids integrity. If you did this, well, that's okay. Have another one. At five years old, it gets bigger, Brother Star. They start to take bigger things and more things. Integrity. It's 24-7 all the time. I never miss an opportunity to teach my kids something. When we would see something happen in life, I would explain to them what's happened and teach them God's way. First John chapter 4, verse number 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. Amen. We want to live through him. Praise God. I feel the Holy Ghost. We want to live through him. Sometimes you have to love people through the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Sometimes you got to love them because he loves you, because God loves you. And you say, I've got to love this man. I've got to love this woman. Even though they're giving me such problems. You have to look at them with spiritual eyes and see, and see who they will become, not who they are today. Verse number 10, herein, here is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the proportion, proportionation for our sins. I said that wrong, sorry. You're asking yourself, Pastor, what does this have to do with integrity? Why are we talking about the love of God? We need to love because we need to love no matter what. We need to have love for sinners, love for our family, love for our friends, love for strangers, no matter what. Your love cannot be directed at only a certain group of people. 
It's impossible to love God and to hate your brother. The Bible says it is impossible. Don't come to me and say, I, I have unforgiveness or I just don't like that person. Let me tell you something. You had better find an altar and you had better repent because you're going to let that person take you to hell. I remember my best friend. He couldn't. This girl, at, woman at church had made him so mad. I don't even know what the argument was about. I have no idea. Drama. Just drama. She made him so mad and because she did something, I don't know, offended him somehow. And in the service, man, we was worshiping God. It was, it was on. We were, we were praising the Lord. And it was a great spirit. And, and I looked at him, and I was like, man, what's wrong with you? He was kind of mad, you know. He was like this. That's universal in all cultures. <laughs> you know, when somebody's like this, they're upset. He was so mad. And I said, what is wrong with you? I'm in the middle of praising God. I look over. What's wrong with you? He said, look at her. I said, yeah, she's worshiping, doing pretty good. He says, no, I can't believe she's worshiping God after what she did to me. I said, <laughs> I said you're going to let, you're going to let what she did to you. Now she's done, made it right with God somehow. I don't know, maybe not, but she's worshiping. You're going to let that take you to hell? You're going to let somebody else put you in hell? I said, are you crazy? You're out of your mind. I won't let anybody do that to me. That's nuts. You don't have that kind of power. You don't have that kind of authority over me. You can give me the, 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 the worst news ever before church, and I'll be like, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to worship God first. <laughs> I'm just going to praise the Lord because that's what I was made to do. I was made to worship him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. You can't say you have heart love or almost love for somebody. Or how about this? Sometimes I love him. Sometimes love. What is that? What if God had sometimes love for you? <laughs> or just part love for you? What if your husband or wife said, you know what? I don't really love you fully. Just let you know. Just want for your information. I know it's been 20, 30, 40 years, but... But all this time, I just want you to know, you know, I never really loved you that much. That much. <laughs> How would that make you feel? Not loved at all, right? <laughs> Correct. You can't, you can't say you only hardly love somebody or halfway. Your love has to be whole. It has to be complete. Like your integrity. Your love has to be complete. I remember... I've told this before, a young minister in, at, in Howland. I was working. He was working for me. I was a manager at AutoZone. I got him a job there part-time. Never should have done that, but got him a job there. And he got the phone call. Somebody needed some help from the church to pick up a motor, an engine, because they were trying to help somebody else. And he said, I said, what would you tell her? I said, no. No. Why? You have a truck. Why can't you put the motor in the back of your truck? He said, I, I don't know. I just don't, I just, I don't think it can handle it. I said, your truck can handle a couple hundred pounds. He's like, well, I said, oh, I get it. You don't want to help her because she's not the pastor. Believe it or not, there's no one here like that. But believe it or not, there are some people in the church who will only help the ministry. They're already gone from here. But there are people like that <laughs> who would only help the ministry, but they won't help their brother or sister unless they maybe pay them. Believe it or not, there are people like that. He was young, and I said, brother, that's not right. I said, you know what? Give me your phone number. I'm going to call. I'm working 12 hours every day, but I'm going to go after work. I'm going to go to that place. I'm going to pick up that motor, and I'm going to do it because they deserve to be helped. And I told him, I said, you don't get to pick and choose who you help. That's not for you. God put this person in your path to test you to see what you would do, and you failed. So I'm going to go do it because I am a true minister. A minister is a servant. You don't, Jesus washed the feet of Judas knowing what Judas was going to do. Knowing the path of Judas, you don't get to pick and choose. 
Your love has to be whole. It has to be complete. Amen. I hope, I hope that's not too hard for somebody here because there's maybe somebody you just don't get along with and they may ask you to help them one day. But remember, you don't get to pick and choose. Now, if you're busy, you're busy. If you have other plans, you have other plans. I'm not saying you got to cancel your vacation. But I'm saying you know your heart. And what you would do for somebody, you may not want to do for somebody else. But that's not your choice. I know that's a hard teaching, but Jesus taught a lot of hard teaching. Amen. He, he messed up the men. And he said that if you, uh, if you commit adultery, you know that's a sin. They said, oh, yeah, we know. I'm not doing that. I won't, I'm not committing adultery, so I'm not worried. He said, yeah, well, let me tell you something. If you think it in your heart. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> that's a hard saying, the disciples said. That's a hard teaching. Yeah, but it's true. It's true. You don't get to pick and choose who you get to help. And I'm closing with, with Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den, most of us know the story. Daniel became one of the three presidents over the 120 princes of the kingdom. He did such a great job that King Darius wanted to put Daniel in second in command, in charge of everything except for the king. He did, but the other men, you know, the story got jealous, and they didn't want to see Daniel to get promoted. So in verse number 5 of Daniel chapter 6, then said these men, these jealous men, these hateful men, these envious men, we shall not find any occasion against this Daniel. We can't find anything wrong with Daniel. He has done nothing wrong. He's innocent. Concerning the law of his, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. What they're saying is we're going to have to use his religion against him. We're going to have to use his faith against him. Daniel was so full of integrity towards his God that they knew he would rather break the law of King Darius before he would break the law of God. I'd rather break the law of this country before I break the law of God. Amen? You understand? That's my, I have integrity. So they framed him for praying to the true God rather than praying to Darius. They set up something, you know, and a statue or whatever, and, and everybody had to pray to, to, to Darius, but Daniel refused to do that. He prayed to God. We got him. We knew he would stay faithful to God. We knew it, even at the penalty of death, even at the penalty that you're going to lose it all, Daniel. We knew he would stay faithful to God. So we used his own faith against him. That's like when people challenge you about abortion or homosexuality. They know your faith. And they want to test you and see if you'll hold true to your faith. So they ask you questions on purpose. And then they want to reveal you as they want to say reveal you as a bigot or a racist or whatever. They throw out Hitler, they throw out all those words. Don't let them do that to you. Stay faithful. Stay faithful. So Daniel was cast into the, the lion's den, never to be heard of again. Wrong. God shut the mouths of those lions. In verse number 20, and when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice. This is the king, King Darius. He cried with a sorrowful voice, a, a mournful voice. He believed Daniel was going to be dead. He believed Daniel was not going to hear him. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O oh, Daniel, Servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continuously, is he able to deliver thee from the lions? What will I hear? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. <laughs> I'm still here, is what he was saying. Uh, I'm still here. Uh, the king of kings has delivered me. Uh, I'm still here, king. Would you stand? And sometimes, saints of God, we have to keep to the word of God. We have to keep 
to our integrity, to the things that we've been taught even as children in Sunday school, even if it may cost us the lion's den. And sometimes, Brother Reyes, all we can say is, I'm still here. I'm still here. <laughs> God, God has kept me so far, or God has kept me. I don't want to say so far because I know he's going to keep keeping you. That's like we used to say, uh, what's this? Something yet. He hasn't, uh, what did he used to say? Oh, I can't remember. Oh, I'm getting old. Anyways, <laughs> don't laugh at me. I'm getting older. Any, anyway, so uh, we'll stop there and we'll continue this uh, another time. I won't beat you over the head with it. We've mixed in other, other messages, other teachings. But I want you to get a hold of this. Pastor, let me tell you something. Pastor's human too. I have flesh too. If you don't think I, I don't know what it's like to be tempted or I don't know what it's like to fail God, or I don't know what it's like to get angry, to be hurt, to get offended. You're crazy. You're crazy. But I've made up in my mind a long time ago, I'm going to serve him. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to worship God. You may think I look nuts when everybody else is quiet and and sitting down during a service, I'll just be shouting and lifting my hands and because you don't you <laughs> you don't determine my worship. It's my relationship with God that determines my worship. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brother Starr, will you dismiss us?